Claudia and Jim were going to go on an adventurous uh, ski outing today. I, um, I hope the fact that they are not back yet uh, does not uh, mean anything bad. Um, so in any case, uh, thank you very much to Thierry and to Tom for putting this wonderful event together. It's really very enjoyable. It's my first time in Les Uches and I certainly hope it's not my last time. I'm, I'm really having a great time here. Um, so I'm supposed to talk a little bit about future perspectives and particle-laden flows. And so I thought what I would do is uh, touch upon a few problems uh, where I feel we have just barely scratched the surface so that there's a lot of more interesting things to do. Um, and so I won't go into too much depth. I'll just um, uh, uh, introduce these problems and uh, mention some of the progress we've made and then some open questions. So some of the problems that we're uh, interested in are related to how sediment gets from rivers uh, eventually into the deep ocean. So the rivers, um, as you know, uh, uh, are typically uh, freshwater and they carry some sediment. Uh, and so then the first process that we're interested in is how does the sediment um, uh, move from the buoyant river plume uh, onto the continental shelf here, so the settling process. And uh, then, uh, you know, over time, we accumulate this uh, layer of sediment on the continental shelf, uh, very similar to a layer of snow in the mountains. And just like the layer of snow in the mountains can go unstable and form an avalanche, uh, we can have these underwater avalanches, uh, which then result in turbidity currents. Uh, and these turbidity currents are the main uh, mechanism by which sediment is then transported from the shallow ocean into the deep ocean where it eventually gets deposited and uh, forms sedimentary rock. And so this is um, a very important part of what is known as the global sediment cycle. So one of the grand challenges that uh, we have to work on is developing accurate models for the global sediment cycle. Uh, so global sediment cycle, of course, means uh, you know, up here in the mountains, weathering and so on destroys the rock. Small pieces of rock uh, go into uh, local creeks and are eventually being swept down into larger rivers, then carried into the coastal ocean, and eventually uh, in the deep ocean they turn into sedimentary rock again, and um, then tectonic motion will uh, eventually uh, uplift them and uh, turn them back into mountains. So the first process that I want to talk about briefly is uh, how um, does uh, sediment settle out of these uh, buoyant river plumes uh, and reach the seafloor? So we're going to look at that in a very simplified fashion. Uh, so we have here a river uh, flowing into the ocean. The river consists of fresh water and sediment. The combination of fresh water and sediment usually is lighter than the salt water of the ocean. And as a result, uh, this uh, plume propagates along the top of the ocean. And so then in a very simplified fashion, we can imagine that down here, we have a situation where fresh water and sediment is uh, situated above salt water. And uh, we want to understand how the sediment now settles out of the fresh water into the salt water and down to the seafloor. Um, so let's focus on the density field here. So we have, this is of course not to scale. We have here fresh water and sediment. Fresh water and sediment together is less dense than the salt water. And so at first glance, you might uh, say, well, we have uh, less dense material above more dense material. So that should be a stable situation. Not much uh, should be happening. Uh, but in reality, there are a couple of interesting mechanisms that can occur uh, and that uh, can lead to some instabilities. The first one is related to the fact that uh, salt, of course, diffuses. Uh, and we can also uh, uh, look at sediment as being something that diffuses, although very slowly. We can look at the limit of uh, sediment as having essentially no diffusion. And so let's um, imagine what happens to a fluid element of freshwater and sediment if we perturb it into the saltwater environment. Well, if we do that, then the sediment pretty much stays in this fluid element, but salinity is diffusing into this fluid element. And so very soon, this fluid element will fill up with salt. And so then it'll contain both salt and sediment. And as a result, it will still be more dense than its environment. And so it'll keep settling. And so that tells you that the original perturbation that we applied here is unstable. And uh, this instability is uh, simply due to the fact that sediment and salt diffuse at different rates. Uh, 
Uh, it's uh, very much uh, similar, of course, to the more well-known uh, double diffusive instability and thermal haline systems where heat and uh, salt diffuse at different rates, but we can look at this uh, in the same uh, framework here as well. And uh, in this case now, salt is the fast diffuser and uh, sediment is the slow diffuser. And there were some very nice experiments being done by Parsons, Bush, and Savitsky uh, almost 20 years ago now where they demonstrated this instability. And so they looked at exactly this case of fresh water and sediment above salt water. Uh, and uh, if they had very small sediment grains, then you can see this uh, uh, double diffusive instability or instability that's very much like uh, the double diffusive instability that we know from thermal haline systems. So it's pretty much a space filling pattern of these uh, fingers that form and that uh, transport uh, uh, sediment downwards. So this is known as the fingering mode, but then they also observed for larger particles a different mode, which they termed the leaking mode. So here we have much more uh, localized structures, much more uh, sharp structures uh, that we see here. Uh, and if we look at this in an animated fashion, we can actually see uh, these structures moving back and forth along this interface. So this seems to be a somewhat different mode from what we see here. And so the difference between these uh, fingering and leaking modes was something that we found intriguing. And so we decided to look at that in some more detail. Um, so of course, ideally what we would like to do is identify two different possible instabilities with these two different scenarios. So we saw already uh, that one possibility for an instability is the double diffusive instability. Uh, and so the fact that this looks very much like a thermal haline double diffusive instability suggests that maybe for small particles, uh, indeed double diffusion is very important. But what about these larger particles? Well, let's look again at our basic situation where we had fresh water and sediment above salt water. So now it's important to realize that sediment, of course, has a stoke settling velocity associated with it. So these sediment grains settle through this interface into the top of the salt water layer. And so that means now at the top of the salt water layer, you have both salt and sediment. Uh, and so that really means that now you have denser material above lighter material. So here you do have a, an overhang. And so that uh, means that you have the possibility to form a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, right? So there is indeed a second possible instability mechanism. And so what we wanted to do is uh, uh, study those two uh, uh, scenarios. So uh, yes, for larger and smaller sediment grains. So the way in which we do that is we model this as a dilute flow system. So we make the assumption that the volume fraction of the particles is quite small. That means we can neglect the influence of the particles in the continuity equation. Uh, so we just have the uh, continuity equation for the incompressible uh, suspension. Um, and then we also know that when the volume fraction is very small, that means the particle radius is much less than the particle separation. So that means we can neglect any collisions, interactions among the particles. And we also assume that the particles are small enough so that their inertia is negligible. And that means that these uh, particles will essentially move with the fluid, plus they will have a superimposed settling velocity. So that's then um, the modeling approach that we use. So we neglect the um, uh, effect of the particles in the continuity equation, but we do take, of course, into account the effect of the particles in the momentum equation. So essentially, we look at the particle concentration as a scalar field that modifies the local density of the suspension. Um, and then, as I said, we assume that the particles move with the fluid and they have a superimposed settling velocity. So that's what we see here then. Uh, these are then our uh, governing equations. So we have here first an equation of state, which says that the density is equal to the density of fresh water plus a component that is proportional to the salinity plus a component proportional to the sediment. Incompressible continuity equation, then the Businesk equation uh, for momentum con conservation, where we have here this uh, density term, where again the density is determined by the 
local sediment concentration. And so the action of gravity on density variations is then what drives the flow. Then a convection diffusion equation for the salt and a convection diffusion equation for the sediment where the sediment now is assumed to move with the fluid plus a superimposed settling velocity. So in this very simple system, just uh, sediment and fresh water above salt water, we don't have any external uh, scales imposed on the system. So we make everything dimensionless with internal scales. And that means we then have four dimensionless parameters. There's a dimensionless settling velocity here, a stability ratio. So that tells us essentially the ratio of the density contribution of salt to the density contribution uh, from the sediment. Um, we have a diffusivity ratio, so the ratio of diffusivities between uh, salt and sediment, and a Schmidt number. And so I just want to show two simulations uh, of these, uh, based on these equations, uh, where we say one simulation, the first simulation applies to small sediment, the second simulation applies to larger sediment, and in our formulation, the only difference is really the Stokes settling velocity uh, which is small for the smaller sediment grains and large for the larger sediment grains. And we will see that we uh, observe some very different behavior. So this is the case for small sediment grains. So the situation that we look at is here fresh water and sediment above salt water. Uh, and then we perturb the interface here initially randomly to trigger some uh, instabilities and uh, we'll see what happens. Let's first look at some 2D simulations. On the left, we have sediment. Here, we have salinity. And you see, as soon as we let things go, uh, indeed, an instability develops. Um, so we have here now uh, uh, sediment being transported downwards. Uh, and uh, we see that here, the concentration contours are quite sharp because sediment diffuses very slowly. Uh, for the salt, the concentration contours are much smoother because its molecular diffusivity is larger. We can then study these kinds of simulations to look, for example, at vorticity fields and so on, uh, which allows for some uh, interpretation of the dynamics. And we see that we typically get these vorticity dipoles that uh, uh, determine these downward facing plumes. And now let's look at this in 3D. And you see the same situation again here, these uh, plumes. Uh, moving upwards and downwards. By the way, up here, this gives you an idea of how big the Stokes settling velocity is, because this is a stable interface here. Now let's look at a crosscut, uh, a horizontal crosscut near the interface. And we see here for the sediment and here for the salinity, uh, these localized plume structures that uh, uh, cut through these um, uh, fingers and, and plumes that are moving up and down. Uh, here's a perspective view of these plumes, and so everything really looks very uh, uh, similar to what we know from the uh, thermohaline situation. And um, so that indicates that indeed here, double diffusive is a very important phenomenon. Then let me show you what happens as we make the settling velocity somewhat larger. So we say that corresponds now to uh, larger sediment grains. And we want to see now if we can reproduce these localized structures that we saw in the experiments here. So here again, sediment and salinity. Uh, first, a 2D simulation. So the first thing that you realize is that uh, fingers are pretty much limited just to the downward motion. There are no strong upward moving fingers. Um, and uh, perhaps with a little bit of goodwill, you can see that uh, these structures are a little bit more isolated. Um, Again, we can look at the interface um, uh, from a perspective point of view. But now, let's look at crosscuts again. Here's sediment. Uh, and um, what we see is first, again, localized structures, localized plumes. But then we see a topological transition that leads to the formation of these sheets. And now you can imagine if you put a light sheet through these uh, 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 sheet-like structures, then you see these very localized structures that Parsons, Bush, and Savitsky observed in their uh, experiments. So here, indeed, uh, what we find out is that uh, here we get, for these larger settling velocities, uh, 
more sheet-like structures instead of plume-like structures. And so we then did a number of um, uh, 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 different simulations for different parameter values uh, so that we could come up with some scaling laws. And so what we find out is essentially the scenario is like this. For small sediment grains, you have a small stoke settling velocity, so the flux of sediment from the top into the interfacial region is quite slow. And um, this small influx of sediment from above is something that can easily be balanced by double diffusive uh, instabilities below the interface. So the double diffusive instability is enough to get rid of all the sediment that comes in from above. On the other hand, for larger sediment grains with a larger stoke settling velocity, we have a much larger influx of sediment from above. Now double diffusion is not enough to get rid of all of that sediment below. So as a result, what happens is sediment accumulates in the interfacial region until the interfacial region has become large enough or thick enough so that we can have a large-scale overturning uh, related to Rayleigh-Taylor instability. And this large-scale overturning, that then creates the sheet-like structures between these individual Rayleigh-Taylor uh, uh, instability structures. So that's the picture that comes out of it. Um, and um, of course, what we're interested in is what is the effective settling velocity of the sediment, because that's something that an oceanographer typically wants to uh, use in order to uh, uh, track the sediment as it settles out of a river plume. And so we can look at horizontally averaged values uh, of um, the settling velocity. So we get a one-dimensional profile. Uh, and then we look at that as a function of time. And so what we see here is this wedge that's opening up. That's related to those uh, uh, plumes that are going downwards and upwards. And we see here in this uh, uh, lower part that the dominant color is blue, which means that we have a settling velocity on the order of one, and in our dimensionless variables, that means the settling velocity is determined by the overall buoyancy velocity of the system, rather than by the stoke settling velocity of individual grains, which here was only 0.04. So we see that this double diffusive instability leads to an acceleration of the settling of the particles by a factor of about 25, which also was the ratio of the two diffusivities. So we've made some initial progress on this, as you can see, but I think there's still a lot of open questions here. Uh, let me just uh, highlight a few of them. So in the real river system, of course, you have a base flow superimposed on the initial configuration of fresh water and sediment above salt water. Uh, so what we did here was everything at rest initially, but in reality, you will have shear. That uh, shear will generate some uh, turbulence, of course, uh, shear instabilities. Those shear instabilities will interact with the double diffusive and the uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, and so the behavior should become much more complex. Also, what we did here were just monodispersed uh, simulations. So for each of our simulations, we just uh, looked at um, uh, particles of one constant size. We had made this dilute assumption. What if we have more concentrated uh, suspension flows? Our uh, sediment, as you know, was uh, completely uh, 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 non-interacting in the sense that there were no collisions, uh, no cohesive forces. Uh, so what happens if we have cohesive sediment? What happens if we have a more complicated 3D-based flow? And also often we have temperature variations between a river outflow and the ambient ocean water. So then we have a third scalar and we might get some triple diffusive instabilities. So these are just some of the open questions that um, uh, I think would be interesting to uh, address in the future. Now related to what I've shown here so far is the next problem that I wanted to briefly mention. Uh, this is uh, related to the uh, Dead Sea. So we've actually started a collaboration with a group of Nadav Lensky, who is uh, uh, with the Geological Survey of Israel, and he's the director of the Dead Sea Observatory. And uh, he made us aware of a very interesting situation in the Dead Sea that has developed over the last 30, 40 years. And let me just uh, give you the key elements of that. So 
just like in many other places in the world as well, rivers that used to flow into the Dead Sea uh, are more and more <laughs> diverted for agricultural purposes and so on. And so as a result, for the last uh, 30, 40 years, the sea level of the Dead Sea has been dropping at about a meter per year, which is substantial. And so as the sea level drops, uh, that means, of course, the salt in the Dead Sea uh, has less water to be dissolved in, and so the um, uh, salinity of the water has been increasing to the point where it's very close to the um, uh, solubility limit. And uh, so what that means, that for the last 30 years or so, uh, salt crystals have been precipitating out of the Dead Sea. Uh, the salt crystals are also called halide, so halide precipitation has been observed. Um, and as a result, uh, uh, the Dead Sea has been forming this layer of salt at the bottom for the last 30 years uh, that hadn't happened before. So let me show you a few pictures here. So this is uh, from the Dead Sea, and you can see here this crust of salt, and apparently the floor here is it's all covered with salt. This is a picture taken from the bottom of the Dead Sea. Uh, people make observations. They put instruments uh, down into the Dead Sea, and when they pull them back up a few days, a few days later, you know, the cables are completely encrusted with salt. Uh, so this is a substantial uh, uh, precipitation of salt. And in fact, the layer at the bottom of the Dead Sea grows at a rate of 10 centimeters a year, which is uh, quite substantial. There's also a short movie here, which Nadav's uh, group uh, generated. So from a, a remotely operated underwater vehicle uh, close to the floor of the Dead Sea. And you can see these crystals here settling. Um, so uh, indeed, these crystals precipitate out because the solubility limit of the Dead Sea is exceeded, uh, and then they settle to the floor. So there are many different aspects uh, of this that uh, uh, need some explanation. For example, there are strong seasonal variations uh, of this precipitation. If you look at this in the winter, uh, in the winter you see this precipitation typically leads to very fine and smooth surfaces uh, at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Whereas over the summer, we form larger crystals. Uh, they are more cubic, um, uh, have uh, uh, you know, uh, very straight surfaces and so on. So it's a clear difference. And so as a result of these differences between winter and summer, uh, we see these uh, strong layers in the salt deposits at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Uh, so the, the white regions here, that's of course the salt. But then every once in a while, uh, you know, it rains even near the Dead Sea, and so you have some mud flowing into the Dead Sea, and that settles out, and that forms these uh, brown regions here. Uh, and so trying to understand the nature of these uh, deposits is uh, quite interesting. You can also see how apparently some of these layers get cut off at some point, uh, and then another layer forms above. And so trying to understand this um, is a very interesting problem. So let me just uh, uh, focus on these uh, seasonal variations. So if you look at the temperature and salinity profiles um, during the winter and during the summer, you see there's a big difference. During the winter, the entire water column is well mixed. Uh, so we pretty much have a constant temperature in red and a constant salinity value. Uh, those are the black uh, crosses here across the entire water column. And it turns out over the winter, uh, pretty much now the entire water column is oversaturated, and that's when you have uh, halide precipitation throughout the entire water column of the Dead Sea. In the summer, on the other hand, the situation is quite different because you form this strong temperature uh, stratification and also salinity stratification. So the temperature difference between the surface of the Dead Sea and the deeper regions uh, reaches up to 12 degrees Celsius. You have a lot of evaporation at the surface. As a result of the strong evaporation, uh, the salinity concentration increases at the surface. And so now you see you have the prerequisites for double diffusive uh, uh, instabilities. You have these um, uh, very warm and salty layers above colder and less salty layers. Uh, and so we can now form these double diffusive instabilities uh, in the uh, metalimnion, so in, in these uh, mid-levels of the lake. So the situation 
is uh, such that we have uh, warm water above cool water, salty water above less salty water. The overall density profile is stable, but we generate a double diffusive instability in the following way. Um, if we again have a perturbation uh, where we allow cold and less water to move up a little bit, then uh, the heat will diffuse in uh, much more rapidly than the salt. And as a result, this region will become even lighter and it'll keep growing in the same way over here. Uh, if we have uh, a downward perturbation, then the heat will diffuse out much more rapidly than the salt. Uh, and as a result, this uh, descending finger cools and uh, it will keep descending. And now as it cools, this very salty uh, uh, finger that came from the, from the upper region of the Dead Sea uh, exceeds its solubility limit and that's when these uh, precipitation uh, phenomena occur. So that's when the crystals precipitate out and uh, that's when we see halide precipitating to the bottom. And so we've done some first simulations um, of this. Um, simply again on this dilute approximation that I had mentioned before uh, of this um, you know, warm and salty above cold and less salty layers. And so indeed we do see these uh, double diffusive instabilities in the temperature field. Uh, this is as time develops and in the salinity field. Uh, and then we can account for the solubility limit. So essentially what we say is uh, that uh, when the salinity that we compute exceeds the local solubility limit, then the excess salinity takes the form of, uh, of crystals or of particular salt. And so then we can track those crystals. And so in that way, we uh, were able to uh, uh, quantify and reproduce some of the experimental observations. So you might ask the question, well, why is this important? Isn't this just a curiosity? Uh, actually, it is not. Uh, so as we know, in the geological record, we have very large salt deposits in many regions of the world. And these salt deposits can be very large in scale. They can be up to a kilometer thick. Um, and they have formed uh, uh, historically over long uh, geological time scales uh, in situations such as what the Dead Sea is experiencing today. Uh, so what is called a hydrological crisis, essentially the water level goes down and, um, uh, and then the salt uh, uh, exceeds its solubility limit and uh, starts to precipitate out. And these uh, large salt uh, um, formations in the geological record are quite important, for example, also in the context of uh, hydrocarbon exploration. And uh, so that's why it's important to understand how these things uh, did develop. Um, and um, uh, the Dead Sea really in today's world is uh, kind of the only uh, uh, modern analog that we have to these uh, uh, situations. So it's really the only deep water body today where we can study this phenomenon of uh, this deposition of uh, salt and the accumulation of a fairly thick layer of salt deposit. So let me just again uh, mention a few uh, open questions that are interesting. Um, so I just showed you essentially the situation close to the center of the Dead Sea where we have a, a very deep water column. Uh, but actually, as it turns out, um, the situation near the shore and in the center can be quite different uh, because as you can imagine, near the shore during the summer, uh, the entire water column, because it's very shallow, will become very hot. So during the summer, we can have dissolution of the salt that was deposited during the winter. Um, and this salt is then being uh, dissolved again and then essentially is, it's uh, transported into the deeper regions of the Dead Sea. So this is a phenomenon uh, known as halide focusing. And these, this transport, this coupling uh, is supposed to occur through gravity currents that go from the shore to the deeper regions uh, through internal waves that can appear in the uh, Dead Sea and so on. Uh, so uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, unresolved questions uh, that we uh, think are worthwhile to address in the future. Uh, and just the general uh, concept of having double diffusion uh, involving particles and phase change 
uh, seems to be a problem that is both relevant and it hasn't been studied all that much yet. Um, then let me move on to the next topic. So as I had mentioned, one area of interest that we're uh, pursuing and that we have been working on for a while are these underwater avalanches, these turbidity currents that can transport sediment from the shallow uh, ocean into the deep ocean. Um, and these underwater avalanches, again, can be huge in scale. Uh, one of them uh, can transport more than 100 cubic kilometers of sediment, so much, much larger, uh, larger than snow avalanches. And they can travel over 1,000 kilometers or more along the seafloor. Uh, and again, they are of interest in the context of hydrocarbon exploration because the sediment that's being transported into the ocean uh, by rivers, that contains some organic matter, the remains of plants and so on. And so when that sediment with the organic matter eventually is deposited in the deep ocean and forms uh, sedimentary rock, this organic matter becomes embedded in the uh, sedimentary rock and uh, that can then turn into oil and gas if the conditions are right in terms of temperature and pressure. So there's an interest in uh, studying the dynamics of these turbidity currents. And uh, we did that for a few years, again, based on this dilute assumption. Uh, and so let me just show you a, a briefly a simulation that uh, my student Mohammed uh, did a number of years ago. This is a lock exchange problem. We've already heard lock about lock exchange problems a bit. So here we have a compartment initially with uh, fresh water and uh, sediment. Then here we have uh, just fresh water, no sediment. To make things a little bit more interesting, we have a local sea mount here. And uh, uh, now we release the lock fluid and uh, then we get this uh, turbidity current. We can study uh, the local wall shear stress, which should be important for uh, sediment erosion. Uh, we can study uh, front velocity, energetics of these currents, and so on. So we worked on that for a while, uh, but there's uh, uh, something important missing in these kinds of simulations. And as I mentioned, these simulations were always based on this dilute assumption. Uh, and this dilute assumption may be okay in the upper regions of the currents, where the sediment really does occupy a very small part of the volume of these turbidity currents. But near the bottom of the turbidity current, uh, you have a very high concentration region uh, where the sediment bed and the turbidity current interact with each other. So in those regions, certainly particle-particle collisions are very important. Uh, the rheology can no longer be assumed to be uh, uh, Newtonian and so on. And so that was something that we couldn't capture with these uh, dilute simulations. And so that's why more recently we have uh, moved into uh, the field of 3D grain resolving DNS simulations. So my <coughs> students have developed this very nice computational tool uh, based on immersed boundary methods that allows us to track several thousand to tens of thousands of particles um, that uh, uh, are being moved now by the flow and these particles uh, are so we, we resolve the flow around each particle. These particles can interact with each other, they can collide with each other, and the flow within all of these pore spaces is being resolved. And so that opens up um, a bunch of new opportunities for exploration. So let me just show you uh, this short movie here again. Um, so in this case, we start out with a sediment bed that is at rest, and then we turn on a relatively weak flow uh, over the top of the sediment bed. And you can see this weak flow sets the particles into motion. Uh, the particles bounce and uh, roll along the, top of the surf, uh, along the top of the sediment bed. We can see some motion, uh, uh, even uh, some, some uh, distance into the bed. Um, and so in this case, it's a fairly weak flow. That's why the sediment transport is pretty much limited to bed load transport. But if we make the flow stronger, we can, of course, get full resuspension uh, and so on. And so because these kinds of simulations now give us complete information about the flow in all of the pore spaces, about the forces acting on the materials, uh, on, on the particles, we can evaluate the stress fields uh, in these planes, uh, in various different planes of the sediment bed.
and hopefully that will allow us to uh, get better ideas uh, about the rheology of these sediment beds um, and so on. So just a few words about uh, how this uh, computational approach works. As I mentioned, it's based on the immersed boundary method. And the immersed boundary method uh, solves the incompressible uh, continuity equation uh, everywhere in the flow. And then in the momentum equation, it uh, applies an extra source term, a force term, at the surface of uh, the particle. Uh, and that force term uh, ensures that we have the no slip condition and the proper uh, uh, force coupling uh, satisfied at the surface of each particle. And so in that way, we get the force distribution on the surface of the particle. And we can then solve the linear momentum equation for the particle. So mass times particle acceleration equals the sum of the forces. And there are, of course, hydrodynamic forces. Uh, then there are volume forces related to gravity, so density difference between the particle and the fluid, and collision forces. And then similarly, we solve an equation for the angular momentum of the particles uh, so that we can properly account for rotational motion of the particles, for rolling of the particles along the bed of the, uh, along the sediment bed, um, and so on. So this approach allows us to get a lot of information, and uh, we can now look at much more uh, vigorous and concentrated flows. Uh, so here we have, again, a sediment bed. Initially, it's at rest. Then we turn on the Poisson flow uh, above the sediment bed. Uh, and initially, we make it quite strong. Then we reduce the strength. So initially, the entire sediment bed is being mobilized. Um, and, and then later on, the parts of the sediment bed near the bottom uh, uh, start to yeah, approach a situation of rest again. And so these kinds of simulations, we can now, again, query for all of the uh, information that is needed to validate uh, uh, stress balances. And uh, hopefully that will, again, allow us to obtain more information about rheology and so on. So one thing that we focused on uh, that we wanted to uh, do that was particularly interesting is we wanted to extend these kinds of simulations to cohesive sediment. Uh, so uh, everything that I've shown you so far was for non-cohesive sediment. So that means particles collide with each other, but then they also bounce off of each other again. Uh, so they don't tend to stick to each other. But we know that in reality, uh, when particles are quite small, so typically below 63 microns, uh, uh, then these cohesive forces, which are due to fluctuating electrostatic charges along the surface of the particles, um, those cohesive forces can become important. They can dominate over gravitational and hydrodynamic forces, and they can account for such effects as flocculation of sediment. So many smaller primary particles uh, come together and form larger particles, larger flocks. Um, and so we wanted to incorporate that into our uh, computational model. So we want to account for these van der Waals forces that um, uh, act between particles as they get close to each other. And so the basic principle of our model is the following. Uh, as two particles get close to each other, there's on one hand a repulsive force uh, that, uh, wants the part that wants to prevent the particle from overlapping. But at the same time, we have this attractive van der Waals force. And so together, taken together, these two give uh, this kind of an attractive force in a very thin shell around the particles, so a shell that's on the order of nanometers. Um, and so we represent this um, uh, attractive force here, this cohesive force, as a parabolic spring model that acts over a very thin shell uh, outside the particle. So as two particles get very close to each other, this force becomes active and it can actually lead to the particles uh, sticking to each other. Uh, and uh, uh, by applying this very simple model, we can simply introduce one new dimensionless uh, parameter, the so-called cohesive number that uh, relates the maximum of this attractive cohesive force to the gravitational, typical gravitational force. And so in the beginning, what we did is we tried to carefully validate uh, this approach, and we did that by looking at this uh, well-established 
uh, drafting, kissing, and tumbling problem uh, that you've probably heard of before. So if you have two particles uh, and they start just above each other with a small gap, if these particles are non-cohesive, so if the cohesive number is zero, then these particles, uh, the, the trailing particle catches up with the leading particle until they touch. That's the drafting stage and the kissing stage. And then they tumble over until they are side by side and then they separate again. So that's this drafting, kissing, tumbling uh, a phenomenon that was studied in some detail by Dan Joseph a number of years ago. Uh, and so our immersed boundary code can correctly reproduce that for non-cohesive particles. And now let me show you what happens for cohesive particles. So it's the same situation. The trailing particle catches up with the leading particle. Um, they kiss, so now they experience the cohesive force. And as they now tumble over and align uh, side by side, they don't separate again. So they stick to each other. And that's the effect of the cohesive force, which wants to hold these particles uh, next to each other. So that's the basic principle of flocculation of cohesive sediment. Uh, so the formation of larger flocks involving many primary particles. Um, and then if we look at particles of different um, sizes, we can see even other interesting phenomena. So here we have a small leading particle, a larger trailing particle. Of course, the larger particle wants to uh, move much more rapidly than the smaller particle. So it overtakes the smaller particle. But the smaller particle then latches on to the larger particle, again, as a result of the cohesive force. And so now that means essentially the smaller particle is settling with the larger settling velocity of the larger particle. So the cohesive force makes the smaller particle stick to the larger particle and in that way settle out much more rapidly than it would do on its own. Um, yes. So then we carried out a simulation where we had about 1,200 uh, polydispersed cohesive particles. Um, we start out initially uh, with a volume fraction of about 15%. Uh, and then we let these particles settle. And so let me show you these three situations here, non-cohesive, mildly cohesive, and strongly cohesive particles. Uh, initial uh, configurations are identical. The color coding simply indicates the uh, downward velocity of the particle. So mostly it's blue, meaning the particles move downward. But then we also see some orange and red occasionally. And that simply means that as the particles settle down, they displace water upwards, so they generate a counterflow, and that counterflow can um, sweep some of the smaller particles uh, upwards. And so then after a long time, you see that indeed the um, water column above this cohesive sediment bed um, loses its particles more rapidly than for the non-cohesive case. And so this is uh, the phenomenon again that I just showed before, that the smaller particles latch on to the larger particles and get um, uh, pulled down more rapidly. And so as a result, the overall settling velocity of the cohesive sediment is larger than that of the non-cohesive sediment. And if we look at a, um, a, a, a blow up of uh, 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 a detail of uh, the situation, then we can see again this phenomenon that we have these smaller particles attached to larger particles. Uh, here we see it, uh, and here, and here, and so uh, uh, that leads to the increase in the settling velocity of these uh, smaller particles. And so again, now these kinds of simulations allow us to extract a whole bunch of information. Uh, here we look at the uh, horizontally averaged volume fraction uh, of um, uh, the sediment bed that's developing. Um, so again, the three initial configurations are the same. Uh, the green line corresponds to the strongly cohesive sediment, black line, the non-cohesive sediment. And then at a later time, you see that, yes, for the cohesive sediment, the, the sediment bed has already grown up to this Y level, whereas for the black non-cohesive sediment, it's still down here. So the sediment bed really grows more rapidly for the uh, cohesive particles due to the effect of larger settling rate. We also see an interesting uh, phenomenon here. Uh, 
uh, that um, the volume fraction of the cohesive sediment near the bottom is somewhat uh, smaller than the volume fraction for the non-cohesive case. And that's related to the fact that these flocks of cohesive particles that form and settle down, they don't pack in an optimal fashion as individual non-cohesive particles would do, right? So these uh, cohesive flocks, they uh, have some pore spaces in between, and um, these pore spaces lead to some uh, less than optimal packing. That's also shown here. So this shows the, evo uh, the evolution of the volume fraction of the sediment near the bottom. And you can see initially the cohesive and the non-cohesive case develop quite similarly. Uh, but then the cohesive case levels off at, um, at a lower value of the volume fraction than the non-cohesive case. We can also track the stresses again, the stress balances uh, in these kinds of simulations. So initially, when all the particles are still suspended in the flow, uh, then of course the entire weight of the particles is supported by the uh, fluid stress. And so uh, it's at, at the bottom surface, all that we feel is the, the uh, fluid pressure, which uh, supports now the weight of both the fluid and the particle weight. But then as particles start to settle out, and particles settle on top of other particles, we develop these force chains that Natalie also mentioned about today. And so then more and more of the particle weight is being supported by these force chains, and less and less is supported by uh, the hydrostatic pressure, by the fluid pressure. And so we can see this transition uh, happening here with time, and uh, we can see that this transition happens more rapidly for the uh, cohesive sediment uh, again, because it settles out more quickly. Just, uh, yeah, a couple of words in, uh, while well we, uh, in an accompanying effort, we also looked at some, uh, uh, we, we, we carried out some space experiments. This was actually my colleague, Paolo Luzzato, uh, to study this uh, flocculation of cohesive sediment. So if you want to study that in a lab on Earth, uh, then, of course, you have the problem that the sediment settles out relatively quickly, so the cohesive forces have very little time to really interact and uh, uh, form larger flocks, whereas in uh, microspace, in, in microgravity, uh, we turn off the gravitational force, and so there we can look at um, the evolution of uh, this cohesive sediment uh, over days, uh, and so we can see how these uh, flocks form here, uh, so how we see larger and larger elements uh, of these uh, uh, primary particles coming together. So I'm almost running out of space, so let me just um, yeah, mention a couple of the, of the interesting questions. Um, so we want to learn about the interaction of cohesive sediment with turbulence. You can imagine, on one hand, turbulence brings particles, primary particles together so that they can form flocks more rapidly, but at the same time the turbulent stresses also will act to break up the flocks, and so there should be a very sensitive balance uh, that would be uh, of interest to study. Then so far everything that we've been doing has been for spherical particles. Clearly it's interesting to go to non-spherical particles. If you actually look at um, cohesive particles under the microscope, uh, you see that they are very often quite flat and more plate-like rather than spherical. Um, interesting questions regarding uh, the erosive behavior of a cohesive sediment bed, uh, mixtures of sand and mud, so cohesive, non-cohesive. Uh, so there are lots of interesting things to study. And so if you still give me about three minutes, then uh, I can uh, just highlight one final topic that's uh, close to my heart, uh, and that is the mudslides and debris flows that we experience near Santa Barbara about a year ago, and this I think is again part of a grand challenge as we have uh, um, more and more intense climate change. Uh, certainly the risk of wildfires has been increasing, especially in the American West and in many other parts of the world as well. And these wildfires, uh, uh, when they uh, destroy the vegetation, um, carry with them the risk of these mud and debris flows. Uh, and so understanding those flows, the hazards, uh, is an important aspect. So here, down here is Santa Barbara, and Montecito is essentially a small suburb of Santa Barbara. Uh, 
And here's a picture with the vertical uh, direction somewhat uh, exaggerated. So this, this whole uh, town here of Montecito is essentially built on um, uh, a debris flow fan. Uh, so over geological timescales, again, these repeated uh, debris flows have built up this uh, plain uh, of soil, and uh, that's what people have now built on. Well, so we have these valleys, uh, canyons from the local hills, feeding into creek beds that go through the city, through the town, um, and uh, that's the part that I want to focus on. So before the fire, this is what the landscape looked like. So it's mostly uh, uh, chaparral uh, vegetation cover, uh, very steep mountains because uh, these are still very young, so we can have slopes of 50 to 80 percent. And then in December of 2017, we had these very large wildfires uh, they covered, I think it was 200 square kilometers uh, of uh, mostly back country, but they came very close to the, uh, to the ocean uh, in this area of Montecito. And so then after the wildfire, and, and actually the firefighters did a tremendous job, so very few houses were lost, uh, but as you can see here, after the wildfire, we essentially have no vegetation left uh, on these uh, hillsides. It's uh, all just ash, uh, essentially, uh, and so that is now very vulnerable to uh, the influence of a strong rainfall. And so that was in December, and then in January we had one intense rainfall, one night. It was not a very long-lasting rainfall, only for about 15 minutes, um, but within these 15 minutes it rained quite hard. And so then something happened like what, uh, um, what Jim showed today, so this is a movie again from the Ilgraben region, which he discussed today. So this is what these creek beds uh, above Montecito looked like before. And so something like this must have happened that uh, these intense uh, debris flows and mudslides came through. And these are uh, uh, enormously destructive. Uh, they can move these boulders uh, that are on the order of 10 tons each, and they just uh, come tumbling down uh, the mountain. And so that's what happened. And so the town of Montecito then looked like this the next morning. So these used to be <coughs> streets here through residential areas. Uh, and you can see how they are just covered with uh, six, eight, ten feet of mud. Uh, and so it was enormously destructive. Uh, Twenty-three people lost their lives. Uh, and uh, here you can see this is what it looked like. So this was essentially the deposit left behind by these debris flows. Uh, and you can see the many boulders that were transported and they smashed into homes and uh, uh, so were enormously destructive. And so these debris flows, of course, are very complex in their rheology. Uh, they involve both um, uh, cohesive and non-cohesive sediments. Uh, as I mentioned, they can transport these very large boulders. And so the questions that we have is, first of all, how are these flows being initiated? Uh, what are their effective properties? Uh, and uh, how can they move such uh, large boulders. And uh, so this is a um, uh, collaboration that I have with Tom Dunn uh, from UCSB. And so what we see when we go up onto the hillsides today is that after that rainstorm, uh, these very strong uh, structures, very characteristic structures uh, form, uh, which we call rills, and they seem to have a fairly regular spacing in some regions. So there seems to be some hydrodynamic instability that involves the sediment transport that creates these kinds of structures, and these structures then seem to have fed into um, these debris flows. Of course, the soil structure is quite complicated after these fires. Uh, you have at the top a layer of ash. Uh, then you have here a region uh, where all the roots of plants and so on uh, burn. So this is a, an organic rich layer which is no longer held together by roots. And then below that we have mud, silt, and sand uh, with some rootlets still holding them together. Uh, and so how this kind of complex soil behaves uh, when there's an intense rainfall is uh, still very uh, uncertain. Um, so then let me um, just summarize uh, uh, these uh, few problems that I uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, so I feel there's still lots and lots of interesting problems. 
that we understand very little about uh, re regarding particle laden flows. So some of the topics that I focused on were cohesive forces. We don't know much yet regarding non-spherical particles, um, the dynamics and rheology of concentrated suspensions of cohesive particles or mixtures of uh, non-cohesive and cohesive particles. I think that's still an open topic. Interaction with turbulence, effective settling rates, role of phase change when we think of the Dead Sea problem and so on. And so making progress on uh, these kinds of topics will uh, allow us to uh, improve our understanding uh, of various uh, grand challenges, the global carbon cycle modeling, global sediment cycle models, uh, threats due to climate change, wildfires, and so on. Uh, so I think uh, these particle laden flows really feed into a number of uh, very, very interesting challenges. So I just want to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, so my group of students and postdocs who worked on this in terms of simulations. Then, as I mentioned, Paolo, who did the um, uh, space experiments, the microgravity experiments on cohesive sediment. My colleague Nadav Glensky from the, um, Lensky from the uh, Geological Survey of Israel. Tom Dunn from UCSB. And then funding from these various agencies. Well, thank you very much. So thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, questions? Thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. I have a question on the first topic about you know, double diffusion with sediment. Mm -hmm. Your simulation and the lava experiment, they, they're all low Reynolds number without flow, right? So they're all low, low Reynolds number. Um, yes, that's right. They're, they're low Reynolds number. So yeah. uh, my question is what determines the size of the cell? Uh, you mean finger. the size of these individual fingers? Finger, yeah. Um, so it's the... Um, and and my, my question in addition to that is, you know, with flow, yes. actual reality, what determines the you know, size of the finger? So the size of the fingers is uh, strongly determined by the molecular diffusivities uh, of uh, salt and, mm -hmm. and sediment and so on. Uh, so that, that's effectively what sets the scale of these double diffusive structures. So you don't expect, you know, this salt finger type of thing is in order of a meter. M maybe they are all, all order of a few centimeters or less? Oh, um, yes, that's right. I think they're typically centimeter scale uh, uh, structures, yeah. But with high Reynolds number interaction with, you know, turbulence? Right. What so would that's, you expect? Something, that's something that we still don't know very much about. We've, uh, we've looked at the influence of shear to some extent, and that's, of course, a problem that Paul Linden, see here? Yeah, okay, Paul Linden looked at that problem already a long time ago through uh, experiments, and we've done some uh, theories, some stability theories, some simulations, uh, and that shows that uh, uh, shear and turbulence can have a strong influence on these structures, uh, and shear in particular can dampen these double diffusive instabilities. Uh, so clearly that's, uh, that's a, uh, an interaction mechanism that we need to explore in some more detail. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, very interesting. So I'm interested in the uh, salt uh, wedge problem, uh, so the entrance of the ocean into the fresh water. And you are, are you, did I understand well, you are saying that um, if you more, the more the salt enters, the more uh, sediments could be entrained. Is there a tendency and then exported to the sea? Um, well, so, so the salt enters in, in, um, in different roles. So on one hand, it's the diffusivity of the salt, the molecular diffusivity of the salt uh, that has an influence. At the same time, it's also the, the so-called stability ratio of the flow, uh, so the ratio of the density contribution of the sediment to the density contribution of the salt, that also has an effect on this double diffusive instability. So you can imagine if you have very little sediment and a lot of salt, then it's hard to form these double diffusive structures, but if those two are closer to each other, then it's easier to form them. 
So yes. So Yes. Okay, yes, that's, that's of course a slightly different problem, but yes, that, that makes sense. Also, another thing is, you know, I mentioned uh, the cohesive uh, sediment, and the cohesive forces of sediment are strongly affected by the salinity of the water. Uh, so they're a strong function of the salinity. And so that's again something where the salinity has a strong influence. The salinity can promote cohesive forces uh, among particles so that they form larger flocks more rapidly which will lead to more rapid uh, settling and so on. Yes. So, yeah, very complex mechanism. Uh, so I have um, two questions. One on the physical questions you showed in this um, interaction between sediment on the one hand and salt on the other is a fingering regime. Mm -hmm. But in double diffusion, there's also this layering regime. And right. this has also been seen in four cases. I mean, uh, the depending on the concentration of the sediment, and the concentration of salt, I could guess that uh, there would also be uh, cases where you find this layering. Right. So that, of course, depends on whether you have the fast diffuser or the slow diffuser, uh, diffuser on top, right? And so here in this case where we had fresh water and sediment above salt water, since salt is the fast diffuser, uh, we only see the, um, uh, the fingering regime. But we've also looked at the opposite situation, and that can be of interest in the following uh, uh, situation, um, if you have a very concentrated uh, river outflow, so the fresh water with a lot of sediment, uh, it can actually be denser than the salt water. So then you have the river plume propagating along the bottom of the ocean. And so now you have fresh water and sediment <coughs> below salt water. And then you have the, uh, the fast diffuser on top. And then you can get this layering regime. So you're absolutely uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, I also have a technical question on this cohesion. I mean, this is extremely Im impressive. I mean, this cohesion force is sort of force of 10 nanometers or so. Right. And then on the other hand, uh, you resolve uh, length scales which are much larger, I mean, up to the, um, uh, the scale of the Dead Sea. I mean, it's very imp impressive. <laughs> but how, but I mean, so how, how do you do this technically? I mean, so for the Dead I mean, Sea, with the, time, with the time scale, I mean. So what we have done so far is the cohesive forces we've only incorporated into these uh, particle resolving simulations. And that's where we have uh, done it in the following way. So our, our particles are on the order of 10 to 50 microns, perhaps. And we have distributed this cohesive force over uh, a region uh, that is maybe on the order of a tenth or a twentieth of the particle diameter. I so, see. so you smear it out. So, right. so this ten, nanom out. 10 nanometers is you don't resolve. And That's I think right. that That's just right. I so think we, would we be smear impossible. It out, but, but it's still yes. a very thin shell around the particle. So it's, it's a small yes. fraction yes. of the particle I think it's diameter. okay. But I mean, I was, uh, I was uh, yes. impressed uh, with these yes. 10 nanometers because this would be very difficult to do. But yeah. I think it's okay to smear it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question, but I believe someone else has a question as well. <laughs> Hi, so I was just wondering in the cohesive simulations, if you saw a pattern in how the shapes of the flocks form? So what we saw is that we often form these flocks where we have, well so far we only have flocks involving very few particles. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was usually a larger particle and then a smaller particle, which was on the upward side of the larger particle. Um, so essentially binding to the larger particle. Uh, but we haven't done very long simulations yet uh, where we could see the, f the formation of much larger flocks. That, of mm -hmm. course, will be very interesting. Uh, and uh, so that's something that we plan to do. Yes. Um, yeah, I had uh, two quick questions. One uh, scientific. Uh, so I was interested in your two cohesive particles that settled. I wonder, is there a simple reason they fall side by side? I, I might expect that they would uh, orient in a different direction uh, when they're stuck together. Well, so that's, that's something that happens whether they are cohesive or non-cohesive. That's this classical drafting, kissing, tumbling problem. You have two particles of the same size uh, uh, falling one above the other. The trailing one catches up with the leading mm -hmm. one, and then they tumble over 
and settle side by side. And when it's non-cohesive, then they split again and they just keep falling side by side. That's the stable configuration. Uh, whereas if you have a cohesive force, then they can stick to each other and so they don't separate again. Um, so that for two particles of the same size, that's the stable configuration. When the two particles have different sizes, then you actually have a preferred angle. Uh, and so when one particle is much smaller than the other one, then the small particle just sits straight on top of the larger particles. If the particle diameter is, uh, if the ratio is on the order of 0.5 or something, then you typically have an inclined uh, uh, angle uh, which corresponds to the stable uh, configuration. Yeah, so you, you're right. Uh, when, when these particles are of different sizes, then you, you uh, have uh, different uh, preferred angles. And my other one is just, a, I guess, a general one in the spirit of the meeting. Uh, so you, you presented all the... Uh, you know, um, work and the information on the Montecito disaster. Right. Um, so in the light of that, does, do, does Montecito reach out to experts like yourself or are there channels for you to help advise and guide in these kind of circumstances? It's, it's actually, it's interesting. Um, so my collaborator, Tom Dunn, uh, who is a faculty member at UCSB, he's in, the, in our uh, Brent School of Environmental Science. So he knows the, the practical situation of these uh, 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 soil configurations and so on much, much better. But where I can help a little bit is with, uh, first of all, the fluid dynamics and then, and then the simulations. Um, so he's been trying to get money uh, to do some research for this. Um, and as it turns out, Montecito is a very wealthy suburb of, Los of, of uh, uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, so we have many actors and professional athletes and so on, uh, people who, who don't enjoy the limelight of Hollywood. They often move to Montecito because they have a little bit more protection there from the paparazzi and so on. And so he has a wealthy neighbor who decided to give him $300,000 uh, to <laughs> look into this. And so we're now, we're now in the process of, uh, of uh, finding a postdoc uh, who might be interested in uh, doing uh, some, especially some field work and maybe some laboratory experiments uh, to understand some of these things better. Yeah. Okay, uh, is there a, uh, any questions from the audience? Or Scott? Scott, so I have uh, just one question that was before, so, <laughs> and then yeah, to stop you, you can discuss after. Thank you for a very interesting talk. My, my first question was, I, I, my only question, I actually had a lot of questions, but we'll talk over the beer or something. Yeah. Um, just the, the simple question I had was, um, y you know, re referring to Paul's work and other work on the sheer in, in, uh, impact on salt fingering in the ocean, which is a heat salt, of course. Right. This would be much more slow because the diffusivities are 100 times more sl slower. Right. And so right. my question is, w would you expect this to actually get swamped to a higher degree by other processes, including the temperature gradients and the shear in the ocean. And a follow-up question is, do, do we see any evidence of these in the actual ocean uh, in, these, uh, in these river plumes? I, I would expect that shear will have a strong effect. I, I don't want to guess yet how strong that effect will be, um, but certainly shear should be expected to have a strong effect. But so far, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, laboratory experiments, uh, even less of ocean observations, that would allow us to quantify that influence. So perhaps let's continue the discussion after. Thank you. Thank you. Just to say that the poster session is starting right now. Uh, we should have also beer and wine to, to have uh, <laughs> even more in interest in the posters uh, before the dinner. <laughs>